Hello, and welcome to Opera Talk Selected Shorts, a way for Opera Theatre of Connecticut to stay in contact with you in our second favorite way, telling great opera stories. We hope to post a new selected short every couple of weeks or so. During this time of social distancing, many of us have turned to our kitchens as centers of calm and innovation. This has led to the rebranding of the college term, the Freshman 15 to the Quarantine 15. During our next few chats, we will talk about the relationship between opera and food, not just about the many, many feasts and banquets and productions, but how opera has influenced the foods we eat. Forty years ago, there was a TV show titled Connections, which featured scientist and broadcaster James Burke that traced the threads joining some action hundreds of years ago to something relevant today, like how astrological knowledge in the ancient Middle East led to the development of the production line, or how covering the hulls of ships in the 1500s with tar connected to DuPont's discovery of nylon. So for this opera talk, we're going to trace how the success of Gilbert and Sullivan led to the creation of four different recipes named for a single amazing singer, which I think is still a gastronomic record. Richard Doyley Cart started his career working for his father in the music publishing and musical instrument manufacturing business. As a young man, he conducted and composed music, but he soon turned to promoting the careers of other artists through his management agency. He brought together the dramatist W.S. Gilbert and the composer Arthur Sullivan and nurtured their collaboration on a series of 13 Savoy operas. He also founded the Doily Cart Opera Company. His theatrical success allowed him to branch out to diversify his portfolio. And after having seen the opulence of American hotels compared to the rather bland English fare of the time, decided to build the first modern luxury hotel in London. The land he bought had been owned by the House of Savoy, an ancient European noble family, so when it opened in 1889, he called it the Savoy Hotel. The theater he had built nearby on the same land in 1881 was, of course, the Savoy Theater, and hence the Savoy Operas of Gilbert and Sullivan. And this hotel was amazing. One of its modern conveniences was an innovation that allowed guests to turn their own lights on and off since they were electric. This new method of illumination had been installed in the Savoy Theater in 1881, the light bulb having just been patented in 1880. And it was green and renewable. Electricity for both the theater and the hotel was steam generated with water provided by the hotel's own artisanal wells heated in the huge boilers under the hotel, which also provided running hot water on demand to the clients. To run this incredible establishment, Doily Cart hired as his hotelier the famed Cesar Ritz, known for his good taste and elegance, if not also his sense of show. It's from his name that we get the adjective Ritzy and the phrase putting on the Ritz. He introduced the phrase, the customer is always right, and was a pioneer of hygiene and cleanliness in hotels. To oversee the new menu and the kitchens at the Savoy, Ritz brought in his favorite chef, with whom he had worked several times before in Europe, Auguste Escoffier, looking so uncomfortable in this marketing PR piece. Among his many culinary innovations and advancements was the setting up of the kitchen in stages or workstations, where specific foods were prepared in a specific place by a cook trained specifically for the task. And his insistence on sobriety, cleanliness, discipline, and quiet from his staff. From the moment the hotel opened its doors in 1889, the most glamorous, famous, and fashionable people of the day poured through its doors. One of the first and most notable regular guests was the famous French actress Sarah Bernhardt, a childhood friend of Escoffier, accompanied by her Irish red setter Tosco. 
who got his name from the masculine spelling of Tosca, the title role of the Victorian Sardou play she made famous worldwide, and which Giacomo Puccini had recently seen when it was touring Italy just a few months earlier. And now we introduce our heroine, a young Australian lass who became a world-famous soprano. Those of you who know me know that I owe my launch into my opera career to an Australian couple, a soprano and her conductor husband, so I have a fondness for singers from down under. Nellie Melba, Dame Grand Cross of the British Empire, born Helen Porter Mitchell, became one of the most famous singers of the late Victorian era and the early 20th century, and was the first Australian to achieve international recognition as a classical musician. She took the pseudonym Melba from Melbourne, her hometown. As a side comment, the Australian $100 bill features her image. I'm still waiting for the mint to put the faces of the Gershwin brothers on one of our notes. Melba studied singing in Melbourne and made a modest success in performances there. After a brief and unsuccessful marriage, and on the strength of her local successes, she moved to Europe in search of a singing career. She traveled first to London, but her debut at the Prince's Hall in Piccadilly Circus in 1886 made little impression, and she sought work unsuccessfully from Arthur Sullivan, who promised her the role of Yum Yum if she cared to wait for a year for it, Carl Rosa, director of the Carl Rosa Opera Company, who actually forgot his appointment with her, surely the biggest mistake he ever made, and Augustus Harris, impresario at Covent Garden who didn't seem impressed with the young colonial at all. So she went to Paris to study with the renowned teacher Mathilde Marchese, who instantly recognized the young singer's potential. She exclaimed, J'ai enfin une étoile, I have a star at last. Melba made such rapid progress that she was allowed to sing the mad scene from Ambroise Thomas's Hamlet at a matinee music hall in Marchese's house in December of the same year in the presence of the composer. The young singer's talent was so evident that less than a year later, the famed producer and agent Maurice Strakoch gave her a 10-year contract at 1,000 francs annually, some ten to $15,000 a year, a great salary for a girl from outside Melbourne. But soon after she had signed with him, she received a far better offer of 3,000 francs per month, yes, at least $30,000 a month, from the Royal Theatre of La Monnaie, Brussels. But Strakoch would not release her from her contract, and even obtained an injunction preventing her from accepting a new one. She was in despair when the matter was resolved by Strakoch's sudden death in October 1887. I've often thought that there was a great murder mystery musical in there. She made her operatic debut four days later as Gilda in Rigoletto at the Royal Theatre Belgium. The London Times described her Gilda an instant triumph of the most emphatic kind, followed a few nights later with an equal success as Violetta in La Traviata. Yes, both debuts in the same week. It was at this time, on Marchese's advice, that she adopted the stage name of Melba. Melba made her Covent Garden debut seven months later in May 1888 in the title role in Lucia de Lammermoor. She received a friendly but not excited reception, partly because of her Australian origins. Part of the Musical Times review reads, she lacks the personal charm necessary to a great figure on the lyric stage. She was offended when Augustus Harris offered her only the small role of the page Oscar in Unballo in Mascara for the next season, so she left England vowing never to return. The following year, she performed at the Paris Opera in the role of Ophelia in Hamlet. The Times of London described this as a brilliant success and said, Madame Melba has a voice of great flexibility. Her acting is expressive and striking. Melba had a strong supporter in London, Lady de Grey, 
whose views and money carried great weight at Covent Garden. Melba was persuaded to return, and Harris cast her in Romeo et Juliette, a French opera likely more suited to her voice. She was a great hit, and soon after this achieved further success in Europe, and later at the Metropolitan Opera, debuting there in 1893 in Lucia. Her repertoire was small. In her whole career, she sang no more than 25 roles, and was closely identified with only 10. She was known for her performances in French and Italian opera, and sang very little German opera. In French operas, her pronunciation was poor, but the composer, Leo de Lieb, said that he did not care whether she sang in French, Italian, German, English, or Chinese, as long as she sang. In the early 1890s, Melba started an affair with Prince Philippe, Duke of Orléans, actually the heir to the French throne. Melba and the Duke were seen frequently together in London, which excited some gossip. But far more suspicion arose when Melba traveled across Europe to St. Petersburg to sing for Tsar Nicholas II. The Duke followed closely behind her, and they were spotted together in St. Petersburg, Paris, Brussels, and Vienna. Philippe had been unofficially engaged to his first cousin, Princess Marguerite of Orléans, but the engagement was cancelled when the affair was revealed. After the scandal started to take a too public turn, the Duke decided that a two-year African safari without Melba would be appropriate. He and Melba did not resume their relationship. By the late 1890s, she was living the sort of gilded life no opera singer of today can match. She would spend the summer season in London and then move to New York for the winter, awash with diamonds and furs, followed by an entourage of secretaries and hangers-on, and living in grand hotels and expensive rented villas. Now, Melba was especially image-conscious. The Rubenesque singer struggled in a never-ending battle to control her weight. She was especially fond of sweets, especially ice cream, and often asked Osquefier if there were other suitably sweet but less fattening desserts to be had. As I said earlier, Melba was not known as a Wagner singer, although she did occasionally sing Elsa in Lohengrin and Elizabeth in Tannhäuser. In 1892, Melba was performing Elsa at Covent Garden, and the Duke of Orléans arranged a dinner party to celebrate her triumph. For the occasion, Escoffier created a new dessert, and to present it, he used an ice sculpture of a swan, an animal featured in the opera. The ice swan carried a silver tambal on which sugared peaches rested on a bed of vanilla ice cream topped with spun raspberry sugar. This eye-popping and extraordinary dessert was dubbed, no, not what you're thinking, it was dubbed Pêche au Singe, or Peach on a Swan. This was not a simple dish to prepare, not merely peach halves casually dropped onto a dollop of ice cream and covered in a fruit sauce. The recipe I'm about to read is not directly from one of Escoffier's many cookbooks, but it is likely a contemporary copy translated into English, and it shares something in common with the master chefs and others' own culinary writings an especially condescending tone and strict commentary about the ingredients and the process. It wasn't until the 1950s or so that haute cuisine cookbooks weren't being written mostly to deter the amateur chef from attempting the far too difficult task of preparing such foods without years of training and skill development. Choose six tender and perfectly ripe peaches. The Montreuil peach is perfect for this dessert. Other peach varieties are possible options, but only if fully ripe. Blanch the peaches separately for two seconds in boiling water, remove them immediately with a slotted spoon, and place them in iced water for a few seconds. Do not blanch more than one peach at a time, since this will change the water's temperature. Peel pit and have them, and place them on a plate, sprinkle them all around with powdered sugar, and refrigerate them for at least one hour. Prepare a liter of very creamy vanilla ice cream. 
Puree 250 grams of very fresh ripe raspberry crushed thoroughly through a fine sieve to extract as much syrupy juice as possible. Using a wooden utensil is best, preferable over metal. It will take a while to extract all the juices from the solids. When finished, you should have only seeds and a bit of pulp left in the strainer. Dispose of the solids. Mix the puree with 150 grams of confectioner's sugar, refrigerate them for at least one hour or until the mixture crystallizes. To serve. Line the bottom of a silver tan bowl with the vanilla ice cream. Delicately place the peaches on top of the ice cream, cut side down, and cover with the raspberry puree. As you can imagine, preparing even a single serving of this dish is terribly time-consuming, and if you're planning to serve it as part of your menu, then you must have the talent and the storage space to keep an entire flock, actually called the bevy, of ice swans available for your clientele. Now, eventually, this did get simplified, but only after a scandal, one not related to Melba herself, when, in 1898, an audit of the Savoy's records discovered that there was over $50,000 worth of wine and spirits missing, Ritz and Escoffier were quietly dismissed. Soon after this, Ritz established the new Carlton Hotel in Haymarket and later commercialized all the hotels he had started in Europe and in England into the Ritz-Carlton chain. Back to the dessert. In this later rendition of Peach on a Swan, the swans were eliminated and the dessert arranged in just a silver or crystal serving bowl. This new presentation was redubbed Peach Melba. Later, for other desserts, he adapted the raspberry sugar for a combination of pureed and strained fresh raspberries, red currant jelly, sugar and cornstarch, and dubbed it Melba sauce. In her constant quest to maintain her weight, often following some 18-day or four-week diet regime, Melba often put her health at risk. In 1897, when a bout of illness made her temporarily unable to tolerate more typical food, Escoffier created a special snack for her by taking the hotel's usually thick sliced bread and grilling it slightly. The slices were then cut through horizontally and grilled again creating dry, thin toasts that were easier to digest. Melba toast became the staple in many homes. It's been commercially available since 1932, and it developed into a popular biscuit for teething babies. There's even a national Melba Toast Day celebrated on March 23rd. Another of the so-called low-calorie dishes created for her by Escoffier is Melba Garniture, Tomatoes stuffed with a mixture of truffles, mushrooms, and chicken blended with a rich white sauce called a velouté, the French word for velvety. The tomatoes are then sprinkled with breadcrumbs and placed under a grill. A champion of young composer Giacomo Puccini, Melba campaigned in London on behalf of La Boheme, an opera she had sung earlier, having studied it with the composer back in 1899. In 1902, she sang the role of Mimi at Covent Garden with young Italian tenor Enrico Caruso as her Rodolfo. Although she announced her retirement in 1926 after her final performance at Covent Garden, she gave so many farewell concerts over the next three years that the saying, more farewells than Nellie Melba was coined. Melba passed away in 1931 of septicemia that she had contracted from an early form of cosmetic surgery for facelifts. She was just shy of her 70th birthday. The epitaph on her tombstone reads, Adio senza rancor, farewell without bitterness. Mimi's words from La Boheme. Join us next time when we follow the threads from Puccini's refusing to work with fellow young composer Ruggiero Leon Cavallo to a dish declared by the Uruguayan Association of Gastronomy, a Uruguayan cultural heritage. And in a later talk, we'll see how two of Rossini's best-known character traits, 
led to servers turning their backs on their clientele in expensive and upscale restaurants. All next time on Selected Shorts.